Hi, and welcome to Risk Matters. I am Arian Patasis, and this is a follow-up from our last week's episode about the different types of AI. If you would like to watch that first episode, please click on the link below. Let's get started. In this episode, we will talk about the broader effects of AI on business and society. When AI first came out, it was branded as the quote-unquote fourth industrial revolution by the head of the World Economic Forum. For reference, the first industrial revolution pertains to the transition from hand production methods to machines through the use of such tools as steam power and water power in the 18th century. The second industrial re revolution was actually the first technological revolution that started in the late 1800s and brought about a huge improvement in communications via railroads and telegraph networks. And then the third revolution was what we experienced about 25 years ago with the rise of personal computers, the use of the internet, etc. While these quote-unquote revolutions are mostly peaceful, they can turn violent when societal structures change dramatically as a result of everything that's going on. For example, the rise of the urban working class in the late 1800s fueled the Marxist and communist revolutions that brought about major political changes in Europe, leading to such events as the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 and many other conflicts during the course of the 20th century. Will AI bring major economic and societal changes right now? Well, let's go to Professor Jeffrey Hinton at the University of Toronto, who is considered by many as the quote-unquote godfather of AI. He said that smarter beings will usually dominate less smart beings. The implication here is that as the machines become smarter than humans, that could lead to existential problems for the human race. That's, a quite, that's quite a dramatic analysis. So the last time humanity faced such a grave threat was with the advent of nuclear weapons, when nations came together to sign the so-called non-proliferation treaties, and in that way acknowledging the extreme danger posed by the uncontrolled spread of nuclear weapons. Based on the concept of mutually assured destruction, the two countries that have had 90% of the world's nuclear weapons, Russia and the United States, ensured that after the Second World War, nuclear weapons would never again be used. And thankfully, this has been the case for the last 80 years. So is it necessary for nations to come together right now and cooperate to keep AI within ethical boundaries in order to preserve humanity? I think most reasonable people would agree that some alignment would be a good idea, but practically it seems that the major nations of the world right now at least are trying to achieve AI supremacy. So it's unlikely that at the moment, as we said, the US and China, who are the two leaders in this area, would get together and cooperate on this major issue. How close are we to machines having self-awareness, meaning that they can think for themselves? This is not a goal and is difficult to achieve, according to Demis Hassabis, founder of Google DeepMind, because machines work based on silicon and not based on the marvelous human brain. So something for you to consider. At the moment, they don't have imagination, nor can they predict future events particularly well. What they primarily do is look backwards by scraping the internet for existing information. But as artificial general intelligence, AGI, makes advances, then machines should be able to more closely mimic human thinking. Therefore, at a basic level, there needs to be some sort of morality built into these systems and into the decision making. Professor Hinton talks about this as a so-called maternal instinct, meaning that these machines would do no harm. But right now, it's anyone's guess how advanced AI will become and whether it can have any meaningful capacity for ethical thinking. What we do know, however, is that according to some estimates, AI could replace as many as 85 million jobs within this year alone. And so everybody from business leaders to parents should be thinking about the labor market and what that will look like in the near to medium term. In the short term, it is likely that lower paid administrative staff in developed economies will suffer the most. Positions such as customer service operators at call centers, data entry analysts, and even some analysts and uh, researchers at consulting firms will probably be replaced. Coders may also suffer a similar fate. Junior lawyers uh, at um, law firms are also probably uh, in that same uh, category. The more repetitive a white-collar job is, the more likely it is to be replaced. What will not, what will not be replaced, however? The first is real experience. So the junior lawyer that does all the grunt work at a law firm may be in trouble. But the senior lawyer with decades of experience fighting and winning legal cases cannot at the moment be replaced by a machine because he or she has judgment, experience, and perspective. In terms of new jobs, an area where some younger people are flocking to in the US at least is blue-collar work. 
becoming plumbers and electricians, for example. Let's, for argument's sake, compare two young men, one with a close to worthless college degree from a second or third rate university who owes fifty dollars to $100,000 in student debt. That's on the one hand. And let's compare that young man with another young man who did not go to college, owes no money, and instead works as a plumber, earning a decent living, setting his own hours, and always being in demand. Who made the better career choice out of the two? I'll leave that up to you. In my opinion, university education will likely become more selective. No longer will it be the goal for parents just to send their child to any university to study any subject with the hope that soon after graduation they can get a job. Instead, people will need to be properly educated, learning more than technical skills and focusing on areas such as history and the classics. It is not by accident that the most popular degree for British Prime Ministers was PPE, Politics, Philosophy and Economics, because leaders were supposed to have a grounding in classics in order to be considered truly educated. Now, not everybody will become Prime Minister, of course, but the fact remains that being truly educated could not be replaced by a machine at this point. Having the ability to exercise critical thinking and having the foundation for that is, in my opinion, the bedrock of the education system. And I think that's what it will move towards in the near future. And what must business leaders do? Well, companies keep talking about how our people are our greatest asset. Whether or not they actually mean that, I leave that to you. But what they must do as a matter of urgency is identify those top performers who can work in this new environment and make every effort to keep their best people for the longer term. And when I say their best people, I'm talking about the top 10 to 15 percent. Again, those individuals that cannot be replaced by machines, but can manage technology and lead people. In this way, organizations can benefit from this combination of human and technological skills. As we come to the end of the segment, I want to close with a more spiritual anecdote to highlight the differences between man and machine. Here in Cyprus, one of our bishops, Athanasios, recently said that he asked AI to write a sermon on the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, just to see for himself what AI was all about. For those of you who may not be familiar with this part of the Bible, it is where the tax collector, who didn't live a particularly virtuous life but was humble, was considered better than the Pharisee who technically lived a life according to the rules but thought that he was something special and was a bit arrogant. The bishop said that after multiple prompts uh, to the AI system, there actually was a very high quality sermon. But he concluded by saying that while the sermon was fact-based and solid, it was not inspired. It was accurate, but you could see that it was not written by a spiritual person who could really bring the emotion and perspective to the sermon. For me, that captured the essence of AI. It is fact-based, it's accurate, it's in-depth, but it is basic and cannot at the moment bring the marvelous characteristics of the human mind. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up and share, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Until next time.